Okay. Welcome to the halachot of the Seder. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Seder is a very, very special evening filled with mitzvot, like a pomegranate, really. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, it is just, it, it's incredible. These, these mitzvot are the are right. These are Torah level uh, laws, and we have so many of them all at once. Uh, it's it's easy to get uh, some of them lost in the shuffle, especially uh, you don't know what, what what's a mitzvah, what's a custom, what's important, what's not important, and so uh, part of what I want to get across in this class is that there uh, there are quite a few mitzvot and they are necessary for men and women, children of chinuch age for sure, and uh, and everybody uh, should do their best to uh, to really have a powerful seder. The seder is supposed to be a very powerful uh, moment. You know, I, I was um, I don't want to get the wrong impression uh, that I that I read this literature often, but I, I was I saw uh, a famous book by a famous rabbi of another Jewish movement to to, to, to try to be as vague as possible, and his whole uh, whole essay. Was written about how ritual in Judaism is different than custom, et cetera, et cetera. Ritual is all about, uh, you know, how you, you know, one of them is about how you feel and one of them is how, how you connect to your past, all these things. That's not true. Okay. N not, neither are customs nor are rituals are about connecting to anything outside of you. They're all about realizing your purpose and living life now it's not about uh remembering uh, a past event the, the whole uh the whole uh, they, they tried to kill us we won let's eat idea <laughs> is is not true that's not what judaism is about we're supposed to and and uh, during the seder we actually say that we say of adam each person each person is supposed to be uh feel as if they're going through the seder right now because they are there is a there is a uh, Mitzrayim that we're all in right now, and when we're celebrating the Seder, we have the spiritual potential to escape that and to to be on our way towards uh, towards Torah and uh, the goal of uh, the the unity of the Jewish people living all together in in the Holy Land. All of that is is within our potential, and we get that potential during the seder night so it's a powerful it's a powerful moment and it's it can be squandered quite easily because uh as uh, my rosh Shiva said and as i've said uh, many times quoting him uh the yetzahara also has a calendar so you know uh like i, was, I just pointed out to somebody just yesterday i was i was speaking to somebody and i said you know adar is supposed to be this time of simcha right this joy and what happens this adar war in ukraine you know uh, terrorist attacks in israel and uh, death and destruction and uh the economy and the gas prices every like uh, how are we supposed to be happy the, the point is ivdu et hashem besimcha ivdu you have to be in you have to be an avid you have to work at becoming uh besameach becoming you know happy happiness isn't uh, just like a, a a momentary thing it's it's a state of mind and the, the way to get there is to know that you have uh, this great potential and to try to do your best to actualize it so uh so yeah, like i said the, the yetzahara has a calendar and he doesn't want us to be besameach so all, all these things happen and and now it's you know Pesach time and the last thing anybody wants to do is anything everybody's tired and everybody feels like they're dragging their heels and and everything seems to be in slow motion that's exactly the Yezahara that's exactly what's supposed to be happening this time of the year as we attempt to um to uh to to, to fight that kind of Yezahara and the, the and, and by fighting it and, and accomplishing that battle, you know, winning that battle will do wonders for you. It'll create a brand new Pesach for you. So that was sort of like the, 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 the theme of many of the classes I've given so far on the topic, especially the last class about the cleaning and how uh, doing it uh, in an efficient manner is, what, is a way to make it easier. You know, as, as they say in many uh, restaurants and many jobs, 
work smarter, not harder, right? So that's uh, it's very true. The, the you know the the blood, sweat, and tears uh, isn't necessarily a part of Pesach. Uh, there, there is a way to do it efficiently and in not such a, not such a difficult manner, an organized manner, et cetera, et cetera. So speaking of organized. Let's uh, let's try to be organized as we talk about the the seder, which means organized. Um, uh, so today will be the laws, and uh, God willing, next uh, Monday night we'll uh, go over some of uh, some insights. Maybe you've heard them before. These aren't my original insights, so uh, you know don't uh, don't quote me. Uh, I'll quote. I'll try to. I'll do my best to quote my sources. All right. So that's uh, that's next week. But this week, let's talk about the laws. Okay, uh, first of all, the Gemara, the Talmud, Psachim, tells us that every person in the different places there, different, everybody is obligated to have a Seder, and everybody's obligated to eat matzah and to drink four cups of wine. Okay, that's what it says. You, you, you can't beat that. It actually says that. The, the, uh, so, and because everybody's obligated to do this, we as a Jewish people are obligated to make sure that those who are impoverished, those people who cannot afford to have a Seder, should have the materials necessary to have a proper Seder. Every single Jew, man and woman, is obligated to give to a, uh, to a person, to a poor person, uh, enough food or enough money to buy food that will be able to fulfill their obligations for the Seder. Now, what did we say the obligations were? Did I say meat? No. Did I say fish? No. Chicken soup? No. What do you have to have? You have to have matzah, not just any matzah. You need to have shmura matzah. We'll talk about that, God willing, when we get to it. Or uh, as it's been called very often, mitzvah matzah. There's a reason it's called that. Uh, and uh, and everybody's obligated to have wine. Uh, we can talk. We're gonna hopefully, if uh, if people want to, we can talk about grape juice versus wine, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, but uh, you have to do the math and figure out how much these things cost, and be able to give at least one poor person enough money that they can afford to uh, to, to do to do this. And if you don't know poor people, uh, your community rabbi will probably know somebody who could use the the help. So, by the way, if, uh, if, if you really want to know how much uh, these things cost, I think I heard that uh, a box of shmura matzah is going for like, what, $15 at, uh, at Costco? Something like that. Yeah, so $15. Uh, bottle of the cheapest wine I can think of, the Sarah B wine in uh, Trader Joe's is what, $6? That's $21. Put I the think box at, least, at least $21 that everybody should uh, should give uh for that particular mitzvah okay questions about that okay so that's that's even before your seder begins uh we're, we're very 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 hypersensitive to this and we are very very focused on this it's the very first thing we say at the seder everybody who's poor should come everybody's invited etc cetera, etc cetera. we want these poor people to have a seder everybody should have a seder uh, happens to be i just had a conversation also today no, not also i had a conversation today with somebody who uh who asked why our shul isn't having a communal seder this year i said uh well there didn't seem to be enough interest uh but anybody who needs a place is invited to my house or uh, some other people are hosting as well and i uh, I, I have uh, i have uh, the the honor and the privilege to help people find a place for the seder if they need okay that's uh little plug um let's um actually it's interesting <laughs> the person on the phone when, when they called uh they said uh i see you guys aren't having a pesach this year <laughs> listen i answered no we're having pesach we have pesach every year we might not have we might, might we might not be having a communal seder but that's we're still having pesach uh <laughs> Pesach happens whether you're having it or not. Uh, so that's a cute little uh, point. Um, the, um, how much? Let's, let's start with the difficult stuff. 
how much must you eat of, uh, of, of uh, how, how much must you drink? Let's start with the wine. Four cups of wine you need to drink and you need to drink a certain amount. Uh, there's a definition of what it means to drink and it has to be a certain amount. Everything in the Talmud, everything in Halacha has a definition. That's actually kind of in the sense a way to think about halacha. It's not an obligation, kind of is, but don't think of it that way. Think of it as a definition. What is this? What is this thing? And so then halacha has to, has to tell you, this thing is such and such. You know, for example, take, uh, take tefillin. The Torah says wear tefillin. So the obligation is already there. Now what, we, what, what are we lacking? If somebody tells you go put on tefillin, and you don't know what these things are, what's the first question you're going to ask? What is this thing? Maze, right? And so halakha comes along to tell you, oh, tefillin are black, tefillin are square, tefillin are leather, uh, you know, they have inside them the shema, they have it in this, in such and such an order. That's all halakha, right? Halakha is defining things. So halakha defines what it means to drink. What it means to drink wine? What is the definition of wine? So uh, there are, of course, various opinions. For sure, if you can, it is ideal to drink wine during the Pesach Seder. If you can. I can give you some examples of people who can't. There are people who can't handle the wine. Their stomach won't handle it. There are people who uh, might be fighting addiction. They should definitely not be having wine. Uh, there are people who are too young or who have weak livers or whatever the case may be, they should not have wine. Um, if a doctor tells somebody not to drink wine for whatever reason, they're supposed to listen to their doctor and not drink wine. So in all those cases, they should have grape juice instead. Uh, who? What? Grape juice isn't anything like wine. It doesn't make you drunk. It doesn't make you as happy as wine will make the people who enjoy wine. Right? What, 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 what's the point of grape juice? And the answer is, ready for this? It's the definition of wine. In halacha, the definition of wine is the juice of a grape. It doesn't have to be fermented to become wine. Pre-fermented, boiled, grape, boiled uh, juice of grape becomes grape juice. And that's part, part of the definition of what wine is. And you can have that. You can have grape juice as wine under, uh, under certain conditions. Ideally, it should be wine. Why? Because wine creates a certain feeling for people who, uh, who enjoy it, right? And I don't, uh, you know, different people enjoy wine in different ways. But, uh, but for sure, it creates a sort of like positive atmosphere, right? That's a... Uh, I don't want to say drunkenness, but uh, I don't. I don't even want to say. I don't even want to say tipsiness, but a little, uh, as 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 they call it in uh, in modern lingo, a little bit of a buzz. You, know, you get a little uh, a little bit uh, lightheaded, uh, slightly. You know, obviously uh, not too much. I hope. Right. A little bit of trailer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's that's. Uh, you, you get a little happy. And, that, and that's the idea. Grape juice doesn't do that for you. If it does, great. Now, listen, if you have uh, some weird relationship with grape juice I don't know about, go I ahead. I love grape juice. Okay. All right. If, 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 it makes you, if it makes you happy to drink grape juice, I, I'm, I'm assuming that's more nurture than nature. You know what I mean? But um, <laughs> so, so, okay. So good. So grape juice might work for you. Um, like I said, there could be all kinds of reasons not to drink wine, and if you don't like it, and if it doesn't make you feel good, for sure, that, uh, that, that should be out of the question. It might be worthwhile, might be worthwhile, probably too late for this year, but it might be worthwhile for somebody who doesn't like wine, and that's the reason they don't, they don't drink wine, it might be worthwhile for them to try to start liking wine just so they can really fulfill the mitzvah of the Seder. I'm not saying they should like get drunk on it, but you know, go to a wine tasting, find a, uh, find a flavor of wine that you like, you know, sip at it a little bit every once in a while, maybe for Kiddush or whatever, and then 
you know, over time, over the course of several months, maybe a year, you'll be an, an, at least like uh, enough adjusted to it that you can enjoy it during the Seder. And then you can fulfill the obligations of the four cups to the ideal point. That's just a suggestion. Just a suggestion. That's not the halacha. Uh, but it's, it's just a, like, like uh, as, as we often know, there's, there are things we can become accustomed to. And it's not a bad idea to become accustomed to wine. There are a lot of obligations that you can fulfill uh, better with wine than grape juice. If, again, uh, assuming none of the other situations that I mentioned earlier of uh, addiction and health concerns, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, clear? I'm not telling anybody to become a drunkard. All right, I just want to put that out there. There should be like a Surgeon General's warning on this class. All right, so, all right, so that's... Uh, drunkenness can be bad for your health and bad for your relationship with Hashem and certainly bad for your relationship with other people, uh, including yourself. Um, all right, so that's, that's that. The, um, <clears throat> how much wine should you drink? What's the definition of drinking? So just to keep it simple, according to Rav Moshe Feinstein, uh, you, the uh, the measurement is 3.3 ounces 3.3 ounces is uh, is what's called revis and that's how much is the obligation to drink at least of the first cup of wine for sure the first of the four cups the first cup is the is the kadesh right is it making kiddish so you're supposed to drink more of the cup then uh so 3.3 ounces for sure and the other cups you could be more lenient perhaps if you need it to be, but I don't see any reason to be unless, you know, you're a Ukrainian refugee or something and you can't find, uh, can't find more than like a cup of wine or something. Uh, but uh, uh, under ordinary circumstances that, that we live in under, I, I don't think, I don't think it's practical for us to speak about, well, what if, what if, what if, of the four cups of wine, try to make sure you're drinking 3.3 ounces. Also, you should drink the majority of the cup that you're drinking, which can become complicated because if you're drinking the majority of the cup and your cup is, let's say, uh, an eight ounce cup, then you need to have at least 4.1 ounces, right? If, you're, if it's a full cup, you need to drink 4.1 ounces for the to drink the majority, and that's more than 3.3. So if you want to drink 3.3 and not have any problems, Try to get a smaller than an eight, eight ounce cup and then drink half of that. Or what we like to do in my family is we find four ounce cups for the Seder, right? So a four ounce cup is definitely more than 3.3 ounces. You fill up the cup, you can drink the whole thing and, uh, and you're definitely fulfilling your obligation of, uh, of uh, the four cups of wine. Questions about that? Okay, let's let's go on to the matzah. Uh, yeah, should we talk about matzah? But we will eventually. Let's let's talk about some of the other things. Let's kind of go in order of the seder. So uh, first we we eat the uh, first we drink the 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 kiddush. We sing the song right, Kadei Shurchat, right? We sing that song, and uh, and then we uh, we drink the kiddush, and then we wash, and then we eat the uh, we, we eat the um, the charoset, not the charoset, the uh, um, karpas. Oh my goodness! All right, <laughs> this is how you know it's late. Uh, so eat the karpas. So the uh, be, be, beyond the philosophy of why we eat the karpas, that might be for next week. Let's talk about how much. What is the karpas? The karpas is a vegetable dipped in salt water. Okay. We make a separate bracha. We wash for it. Why do we wash? It's also halacha. We wash because we're eating a wet vegetable. Anytime you eat a, a wet vegetable, you should wash without a bracha, by the way. But you should always wash. And, and that's basically a reminder of the times when we were concerned about tuma. If you were, if you were tame, sorry, if the, or if the food was tame and it was wet with any, any of the seven uh, uh, moistures, that tuma can transfer between the person and the food or the food and the person. And that would be a problem under certain conditions if you were planning on going to the Beit HaMikdash 
right? Or if you're a coin, or if you're eating truma, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So as a reminder of those halachot that we don't really keep nowadays, but we have some reminders of them because God willing, soon we'll be keeping them again. So therefore, we have little reminders of those commandments, including this commandment, this uh, this halacha of washing before eating wet vegetable or wet fruit, by the way. So by the way, just side point, very often, you you know, you might wash an apple before you eat it. Not a bad idea. Right? And, uh, and, and it, you might not have dried it well, and you're about to eat it, you should probably wash your hands first before eating the apple. Or, as most people, I think, I don't know if it's most people, I've never really done a study, but I think a lot of people, what they do is they just wrap the apple up in like a paper towel, and that's what, it's drying it, and it's not a problem then. Uh, and also, you're not touching it directly. A lot of, uh, th that solves a lot of problems. Um, Sorry, what's the what's the what's the thought behind wet vegetables and fruit? Uh, we just we just said it's uh, it's a reminder of the times we were concerned about tuma, oh, and okay. tuma can transfer if the food is wet with any of the seven liquids. All right, so that's uh, so we don't we don't want to do that for that reason. So um, so it's very important to uh, consider that. Okay, so now you've got this uh, wet uh, vegetable. It's about to get wet because you're going to dip it in, in salt water, which is for sure going to get wet. And uh, you make hadama, you eat it. Uh, some people say uh, you're supposed to have in mind uh, the um, the uh, the bitter herbs you're going to eat later, and uh, the maror. And, and so yeah, so, the, so the, that's that's an important thing to do. Although it's a little bit funny because the maror you're eating after you eat the, the matzah and matzah is, is bread. So you've really fulfilled your obligation of saying a blessing for food with that. You don't need a special hadama on the maror, you would think. So there's uh, there are different answers for that. Not, not really within our purview, but definitely something for you to think about, you know, it's, uh, while you're doing, <laughs> while you're going through the, your, your other, uh, your other uh, actions of the day, Think in the back of your mind about why it is that we have to make a bracha hadama for the maror that you're going to eat after the hamotzi of the matzah. Anyway, so while you're thinking about that, let's talk about the uh, the, the the vegetable you're eating for karpas. What vegetable are you eating? So it happens to be the majority of say Israelis eat for uh, karpas. They eat a, uh, a a stalk of of um, parsley. That's dipped in salt water. Okay. Is there anything wrong with eating parsley? No. Assuming you washed it, there's no bugs. Should be no problem. One of the benefits of eating parsley as your karpas is the fact that you don't have to worry about the problem of a kazayat. Why are we worried about a kazayat? Because it's going to be a long time before you start eating the real meal. We haven't really gotten really deep into the magid yet. We haven't even started the Magid yet, honestly. And so, uh, so it's going to probably take a while, depending on how fast you get through the Magid. It's probably going to be uh, at least an hour, say, right? I don't know. I don't know how you guys do it. But uh, let's, let's say it's going to be at least an hour before you actually get to actual eating. So that's too long to wait. You'd have to make a Bracha Acharona after eating uh, a Kazayat, which is, let's say, 1.1 uh, ounces of the vegetable. Now. Uh, the uh, the parsley, you're very. It's very unlikely that you're eating uh, 1.1 ounces of parsley. That would be, I mean, I, again, I don't want to judge anybody here, but it's I think unusual for people to eat that. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's a uh, it's an herb. It's not really. Uh, it's not meant to be the main course. Uh, but uh, yeah. Anyway, so that's that. So that's one of the benefits of eating parsley. Uh, in my family, we have the tradition of eating a potato. Obviously not a new tradition, but obviously not a very old tradition. What do I mean by that? So it's, a, it's not a new tradition. It's, uh, people have been doing it in Europe ever since the potato was introduced from Peru. We have a whole class of the potato elsewhere. Uh, and uh, the, when the potato was introduced to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Europe, to the old world, as it's called very often, uh, that's when people started eating these kinds of things for 
for, uh, for, for the Seder and other things. Now, the reason that people eat the potato is because potato is new. The potato is special. The potato is somewhat filling. It'll give you the energy you need, at least uh, so, so goes the thought. It'll give you the energy you need to get through the Magid and not be starving to death by the time you get to the matzah. All right? That's the idea. Um, take it for what it's worth. Other people use all kinds of other vegetables. As long as it's not the maror, you should be fine. You should not eat maror for your karpas. I've seen people do that as well. They don't have anything else. They've got lettuce. They're going to eat lettuce later. So they take a little bit of lettuce and they dip it in salt water uh, and, uh, and that. that that's, that's not the idea. That's not what you should do. Um, questions about karpas? Oh, sorry. One very, very important point. I mentioned, I, I mentioned parsley. I mentioned potato. The important thing is the most, the best vegetable to eat for karpas is whatever your tradition is. The best vegetable to eat is whatever you use you used to eat, assuming you assuming, of course, that you have a tradition. Uh, obviously, with the the Balachuva movement uh, that started uh, not started, but uh, definitely gained ground in the late eight, '60s, uh, etc. Uh, so the, the the idea of of, of uh, traditions and customs, of family customs and stuff like that, that sort of changed over time. But what you should know for sure is that you can eat whatever vegetable you want, but it's best to eat whatever it is that you know your family tradition is. Whatever, whatever your family ate, whatever your father ate for karpas is what you should eat for karpas. Who should eat karpas? Everyone. Man, woman, and child. Right? There's, uh, there should be no reason not to eat the karpas. It's part of the Seder. But very important uh, distinction it is not a halacha it is a custom it's it doesn't have the it's not a deraita halacha you don't have to eat karpas if you didn't eat the karpas you can still fulfill your obligation of having a pesach seder uh and uh so it's not as obligatory as say the matzah or the grape juice slash wine questions about that okay let's go on to the matzah Ah, matzah. Uh, some people love matzah. Some people don't. Uh, I think that I think that's, that's also part of uh, nature and nurture. But uh, the important thing is that uh, that matzah can be can be a very beloved thing. I know in my family the kids love matzah. My wife loves matzah. I love. We, we just uh, we're a family of matzah eaters. We eat matzah all year long if uh, if we had the opportunity. Even shmura matzah. Huh. Yeah, we even like shmura matzah. It tastes like cardboard, but we still love it. I don't know why. Uh, maybe we like the crunch. I don't know. Either way, uh, what was that? You were muted. I said, good for you. Yeah, it works for us. <laughs> All right. So, uh, but it's, it, it, you're not obligated to like it. You are obligated to eat it. So, uh, so how much should you eat, et cetera? Uh, <laughs> we always have a problem with this with the shul seder because uh, we uh, we spend some time separating the matzahs to the the amount that uh, that, that the uh, the halacha is how much somebody should eat and we give it around to people and then we see people doing all kinds of different things with the matzah. Some people uh, some people eat it. Some people give it away. Some people use it as a frisbee. Um, <laughs> whatever the case may be, uh, here's how much you should eat of matzah. Uh, let's start talking with uh, the round, handmade shmura matzahs. They should uh, be consumed. You should eat about a half of one for your mitzvah matzah obligation. You made a bracha, al achilat matzah, brachat Hashem, alakinu melech alam, sheki dishanu b'mitzvah v'tzivanu, achilat matzah. So you, you made a bracha for the eating of matzah. You, it is a mitzvah. And you should do it as best you can on the Doraita level and the Dorabana level, which includes to eat basically approximately half of a full Shmura Matzah. Now, obviously, there's a Seder leader, right? There's a, the, 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 the person, the, the head of the table, right? You do the, the Seder leader. And he distributes Matzah from his Matzah that he made a bracha on. And then that Matzah needs to be added to more Matzah. And all of that needs to be eaten. Now, 
here's where here's when uh, here's where we give away what, what yeshiva you went to how fast must you eat the matzah so so the uh, the idea is you have to do every mitzvah there's an idea of zrizut be mitzvot you have to do mitzvot as fast as possible as efficiently as possible so you have to eat the matzah as fast as possible uh, uh, within within a certain time, ideally within what's called Gedei Achilat Prat, right? So this is a, a certain amount of time, say approximately three minutes, the, the amount of time that it takes to walk a paras, which is a certain distance, okay? So, uh, and, and we say that takes about three minutes. I think, uh, I think, it's, I think we uh, define it as about a quarter of a mile or something like that. There's a process. You say right, 30 so, minutes? No, three. Three minutes? Yeah, three okay. minutes. I was like, how, what? That's how long does it take you to walk a mile? Right? So so uh, I think in, in general, I, I think people say it takes about uh, about 12 minutes or so to walk a mile. It depends on how slow you're walking. It's, if, you're doing like, if you're doing like the New York stride, it might be a little faster. I don't know. Uh, either way, um, the... Uh, the Kadeh uh, Hilat Prat is approximately three minutes. So you should eat all of that matzah, that half matzah, within about three minutes. You should not interrupt the conversation. You should uh, ideally not make faces. That's a, a common thing in uh, a lot of Sadarim that I've been to. Uh, people are already like uh, using their eyes to complain about the matzah. Right? So try not to do that. It's, it's, uh, it, I know it's funny, but remember, this is you're doing a mitzvah here. Uh, you, you you wouldn't be making faces like that if you were to say listening to the shofar. I hope, right? And that's equal level mitzvah. Uh, listening to the shofar and eating matzah are on the same level, pretty much. So, again, you should you should not make faces. You should definitely should not interrupt the conversation or anything else. You should eat the matzah as fast as you can, and uh, that amount. If you're eating your shmura matzah, and by the way, it should be shmura matzah for the mitzvah. Uh, obligation, um, which brings up another question. I don't know if we'll have time for this tonight. Uh, the other question of whether uh, wh whether it's a mitzvah to eat matzah the rest of Pesach. There's an interesting halacha question about that because if it is a mitzvah to eat matzah the rest of Pesach, then to then you would only fulfill that mitzvah also with mitzvah matzah. You would also need shemura matzah to fulfill that obligation, which some people do. There are some people who insist on eating shemura matzah all the time. It's not because it's more kosher. It's a big misnomer. A lot of people think that there's some people who are very strict and they want to, you know, they want to make sure their matzah is super kosher, so they only eat mitzvah matzah. No, that's not the point. The, the reason to eat mitzvah matzah is because it is higher level, it's higher quality matzah, and it definitely fulfills the obligation the uh, biblical obligation of eating matzah. And if it's a biblical obligation to eat matzah all Pesach long, like some authorities, including the Vilna Gon, have written, therefore, it would be a good idea to eat uh, mitzvah matzah instead of any other kind. All right. That's enough about that. Uh, if your mitzvah matzah is machine-made, not the handmade round one, but the machine-made square one, um, there is at least some debate about which one is better. Uh, I, I have no opinion on that subject, in case, you're, in case you want to quote me. I have no opinion at all. I think they're equally good. Uh, there's, there's benefits to each one. Obviously, um, uh, the round ones are how we used to do it before. There's no machine involved, which is why it's called handmade, not machine made. Right? There's no machine involved. And it's how we used to do it for uh, thousands of years. So obviously there's, there's, there's that. On the other hand, the machine-made matzah cuts out the possibility of human error. Right? Too much time, too much uh, you know, waiting, too much moisture, whatever it is. You know, there's uh, much less of a problem uh, in that case with machine-made matzah, which is why, for example, I know uh, people in, uh, I think, I'm not sure if the brisk community, Certainly, the the Yeki community prefer machine made matzah, and they ha they have what to stand on for that. And as I said, I don't have an opinion beyond the fact that both are equally good. 
uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the mitzvah, uh, in terms of taste, I have opinions, but I'm not going to share them. All right. Anyway, uh, uh, so if you're going to eat a machine shmura matzah, which is perfectly, like I said, according uh, in my opinion, perfectly kosher, uh, a machine made shmura matzah, you should eat two thirds. Two thirds of one of those is a kazayit. Two thirds. Uh, luckily, there's already lines drawn on it, so so it's fine, easy way, easy to find uh, two thirds. <laughs> you know, okay. So uh, that's that, and also within that same amount of time, and it's up to you to decide which one's easier to do. Uh, so that's that. The next time we eat is uh, is the maror, okay. And maror, there are a, a great amount of vegetables you could use. And again, halacha comes, uh, comes again with the exact same definition we've had before. What does it mean to eat? What it means to eat is to have 1.1 ounces of something. It's very interesting, by the way, and not much has changed in that regard, right? Because you, uh, you open up, you, you, you find your regular, uh, not, on, not on Pesach, you know, you're on a plane or whatever, and there's a, a bag of nuts, a bag of pretzels. How big is that bag? What's the size? What's the volume of that food? It's usually somewhere around 1.1 ounces. A granola bar. Somewhere around 1.1 ounces. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting fact that... A that's... bar or a Nature Valley bar? <laughs> I don't know. I'm actually different. curious with the size because, like, the, I, I do really well with visualizations. I, 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 I think they're the same. Major Valley is bigger. It's got the like two bar. Similar. Yeah, it's the chewies are the little skinny, the chocolate chip chewies. Oh, uh, the ch those are smaller than an ounce. I think they're like three quarters of an ounce. So, Nature and Valley is probably the 1.1. Yeah, well. When it comes if you want, if you want to make a bracha harona, by the way, interesting again, aside from Pesach here, but uh, in terms of the laws of brachot, right? If you're going to have 1.1 ounces of a product and assuming it's the same blessing, you would need to make an after blessing for that product after eating 1.1 ounces. What do I mean by that? Let's say you have a, um, uh, a bereka. Okay, a bereka. You're gonna probably make a mizonot, right? Made from uh, made from flour, not on Pesach. Make sure you don't don't eat barakas on Pesach, right? Unless it's made from like potato starch or whatever. So okay, so you've got you've got the bereka inside. Let's say there's potato, okay. So how much? Let, let's say the bereka is, I don't know what, uh, three ounces, two two ounces, whatever it is, probably about two ounces. How much of those two ounces is the mizono that you made the bracha on? So you probably don't have 1.1 ounces of mizono in that, right? So you probably, after having one baraka, for sure, you should probably not make a, uh, an alhamikya. You might, if it's a very big baraka, you might want to make a uh, brain of fashot afterwards because you're, you're dealing with, uh, because there's so much potato or whatever the, the, whatever the insides are. All right, new topic, new topic. Uh, so that, let's talk about the maror now, okay? Uh, you're eating the maror, and depending on which vegetable you choose, it might be easier or harder to eat uh, this 1.1 ounces. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of people who have the custom of having horseradish. That horseradish needs to be fresh, needs to not be the canned stuff, the stuff that they sell with the beet juice in it and it's turned it red is not good for this. You cannot fulfill your mitzvah of maror eating that. You can also probably not fulfill your obligation eating the jarred white horseradish because that too has lost some of its bite. It has to be fresh if you're going to eat horseradish. And it has to be 1.1 ounces, which is a huge amount of food to eat uh, that's uh, very bitter tasting. By the way, Horseradish is not the Talmud's ideal uh, vegetable for maror. What's the Talmud's ideal vegetable? Lettuce. Not just lettuce, Rome. romaine lettuce. 
-hmm. romaine lettuce. And you might say, wait a minute, Rabbi, romaine lettuce isn't bitter. And the answer is, well, it's not bitter today. It used to be more bitter in previous generations, especially when the Talmud was written. Right? We have, uh, we have engineered our fruits and vegetables to taste the way we want them to taste. And romaine lettuce isn't as bitter as it used to be. However, it can still be used as maror. Uh, some people are, uh, I think I've mentioned before, the Beni Shchai mentions that the reason that most people don't, or not that most people don't, but that it's not the most popular you, uh, kind of maror to use, he said is because of the, uh, the insect issue. So for those people who always bring up to me, Rabbi, we didn't used to care about insects as much as we do nowadays or whatever. Uh, listen, the Ben Yishchai lived over 100 years ago, and apparently uh, even in Baghdad, they cared about these things. So uh, insect infestations are a real thing. Um, I just just today I posted some interesting pictures I found uh, of uh, ladybugs, actually ladybugs in a bag of cilantro, and then a completely different company of lettuce uh, had a ladybug inside that. So, by the way, just so you know, the favorite food of ladybugs is uh, our aphids. So, if there's a ladybug in a bag of lettuce. There's probably something else in that bag of lettuce. That's right, aphids. All right, so I think I've seen what, aphids in lettuce. There are like lots of aphids. Green, in lettuce. yeah. Yeah, uh, depending. They're not always green. It depends on their age. Uh, they're green when they're like middle aged. Uh, they, they they're also <laughs> red, and they're sometimes very uh, very light green. Anyway, all kinds of colors. I've seen all kinds of aphids just today. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm an aphid expert. Uh, so. Uh, me and aphids, we go way back. Anyway, so back to <laughs> back to this. The uh, so I, the the ideal uh, is the romaine lettuce, and to get one point one ounces is not so simple. What many people do is they use a, a chart, basically a sheet of paper, uh, right? A, a sheet of paper. Uh, if you cover a sheet of paper with enough lettuce to cover the paper, that's approximately the one point one ounces that you need for the mitzvah of maror. Um, I don't know if I should, yeah, you know, I'm going to mention it, even though you might not have access to this, so it doesn't matter. Inside romaine lettuce, as they grow, there are some, there's something called a cedar, not a cedar, a cedar. And that's basically the, uh, the, the hard middle part from which the lettuce grows. And uh, there are people who, I heard uh, somebody once told me that Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky was, uh, was very machmir about using that, uh, the cedar itself, as the, uh, as the maror. It is much more bitter than the rest of the lettuce. And you have the added benefit of not having to worry about bugs. You, you can shave it down and basically turns into something that looks a lot like, uh, like horseradish, right? Uh, depending on how, how how big of a cedar it is, and it's it's not as bitter as horseradish for sure. And you, the other b benefit is you don't have to worry so much about the kazayit. It's much easier to measure a kazayit of a harder thing instead of a flat thing like uh, like lettuce, right? Also, maybe maybe one of the reasons why people use potato for carpas. All right, enough about that. So that's maror. Then you get the 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 hillel sandwich. Right, and the hillel sandwich is also matzah and also maror. By the way, the maror, before you eat it, you dip it into haroset, which is the yummy stuff, right? And then you do something that nobody understands, and that is you shake it off. Now you, should, you dip it into the most delicious thing in the world, and then you don't eat that delicious thing. You shake it off, and then you eat the maror. And again, you have to eat the maror uh, as quickly as possible. Kadeachilat prat. Within that uh, within that time period. Now, also, also, it should be mentioned uh, that there is a special halacha of the seder, and that is when you're doing these mitzvot of eating and drinking, you should be in a position called a seva, otherwise known as uh, reclining. Very, very unusual custom slash halacha, and. Uh, 
part of the reason it's unusual is because it's considered, or at least the Talmud makes it very clear, it's considered a rude thing to do in front of people that you're supposed to respect. So, for example, leading while eating in front of the king, or in front of your Rebbe, or in front of your father is considered rude, and you shouldn't do it unless you get their permission. And there's a whole topic of whether you can get permission for such things, but from your father, you can certainly get permission to, um, to lean if, uh, if, uh, if you want to lean. Uh, that particular custom is specific to men, by the way, and, uh, and it had to do with uh, how the upper class in Rome used to eat. Um, and we don't completely lie down on the couch like they used to do. 45 degree angle, yes, it is defined as a 45 degree angle. Any less than that, you're not actually leaning. Because remember, what is halacha doing? Halacha is defining. And if, and if you're told that you have to lean, so the halacha is going to tell you how much you have to lean. Sorry. Uh, all right. Busy night, busy night. Okay, so um, what were we talking about? Yeah, so Haseba, um, the, uh, the, the Ashkenazi custom is for women not to lean. Uh, the Sephardic custom is for women to lean. Um, that's uh, as per Chazon and the Kafa Chaim. Um, Obviously, uh, if you get permission, uh, a Rebbe from your Rebbe and you're eating with your Rebbe, you can certainly uh, lean. Uh, the, but we do not lean when eating the karpas, partly because it's just a custom and partly because it's a reminder of something sad um, because of the, the, the water the, the is uh, symbolic of the tears. And we also do not lean when we're fulfilling the mitzvah of maror, even though maror is a mitzvah, and we're it's it's part of the seder, nevertheless we do not actually lean when eating the maror. Uh, then we eat the hillel sandwich, like I said, which is the matzah and the maror together, which is uh, we call it a hillel sandwich, although that's pretty inaccurate. Which is we're fulfilling the the opinion of hillel, which is to eat the uh, the the pesach offering. And the matzah and the maror all at once, which uh, which basically fulfills all three mitzvot uh, uh, together. Uh, that uh, that particular uh, thing is not actually a mitzvah because we're just doing it in memory of a halacha. So what we're doing is uh, we we don't need to have that kazayit anymore. We can we can uh, get away with eating less than the kazayit. Uh, most people eat half of the measurements I gave before, so a quarter of a round shmura matzah, a half a page of, uh, of uh, lettuce, etc. Uh, so like basically a half ounce or 0.6 or 0.55, all right, whatever it is. All right, so that's that. The, um, the other uh, mitzvah of eating uh, that night is the afikomen. Not going to get into the whole whether we should steal or not, the afikomen, I talked about that uh, in quite some detail last year. Um, the, um, the afikomen needs to be eaten before, uh, before halachic midnight. Again, halacha defines what midnight is, right? So uh, similarly, uh, we're, we're, uh, we have to eat this before halachic midnight, ideally. And uh, we need to make sure that that happens. Uh, a halakhic midnight nowadays is something like 1 a.m. There's a really good chance you'll be done, you know, with your magid and with your meal by 1 a.m. The problem is what usually happens, what I've usually seen from people, is that they get stuffed on the suda. They eat too much during the suda. 
and uh, they're eating the brisket and the chicken soup and the whatever else, and they're all stuffed. They can't eat anymore. And then, uh, and then you tell them, okay, now you, it's now it's time to eat the afikomen, and the afikomen is a mitzvah, and you have to have as much as you had for the mitzvah matzah, which is one point one ounces. It's a lot. It's a lot. So what do you do in such a case? So what you do is um, you don't overeat. <laughs> Control yourself. That's part of uh, that's part of being a free person is having a, a lot of delicious food in front of you. And having the willpower to say no, I won't have two bites, uh, you know, two extra bites of the 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 kugel, you know, assuming you have kugel. Uh, so that's that that's a, a good uh, good habit in general, by the way. Okay, next. After the afikomen, you bench, you uh, you you drink your next cup of wine, then you do the halal, and then you drink your fourth cup of wine. All of those cups of wine should ideally, again, be 3.3 ounces and should be the majority of a cup. And that's the eating. That's the basically all the mitzvot of the day. Now, I've, I've, mentioned, I've mentioned this before, and I'll mention it again. Like I said, we start the Seder by singing Kadesh Urchas all the way down to Nirza. And there's a reason for that. The reason is because that's your goal. You want to get to Nirza. Everybody needs to get the feeling, the, uh, the, the, the joy of singing Hagadya together, of singing who knows one together, right? Echad mi or whatever other uh, languages you, you say it in. So there, there, that's part of the Seder. There's, there are other things to do after the Seder, by the way. There's, if, you're, if you still have energy, there's a custom to say Shir Hashirim, right? And if you still have energy, you can... Uh, Learn about the, the laws of the Seder and about the Korban Pesach all night long until your students come and tell you, uh, rabbis, it's time to say morning Shema. So that's, <laughs> that's what you can do. That's, that's how we can uh, best fulfill the Seder. Uh, if you have any questions and you're too embarrassed to ask in public, don't, uh, don't mind me. Be, uh, I'm, I'm willing to take your, uh, your texts. Uh, I've, I've, people have been doing that all day long for the last couple of days. So Baruch Hashem, we have people asking questions, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the live uh, stream to Facebook, and then if you have any questions,